In Asheville, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian radio show broadcasting out of occupied Salagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world. On this podcast mini we feature the voices of two incarcerated comrades, Jennifer Amelie Rose and Comrade Z. Both chats were conducted through the mail and are voiced by comrades from the Channel Zero Network. Take a look at our show notes for transcriptions of both of these chats. First, you'll hear from Jennifer Rose. Jennifer, formerly known as Jennifer Gann, is a member of the Fire Ant Collective, which just released its sixth issue and is due to put out another very soon. She's a trans woman who came up in Southern California's punk scene in the 1980s. She became politicized and began organizing inside a prison since the 1990s. Jennifer Rose has a parole hearing that she could use support letters for coming up on July 28th, 2020, and also letters of support for her commutation application. To find out more on how to format support letters, you can email her lawyer, Richard Rutledge, at rlaw at rutledgeattorneys.com, or you can write to the address for Mr. Rutledge in our show notes. You can also learn more about Jennifer Rose's case by visiting babygirlgan.noblogs.org. That's Gan has two N's, where you can find out how to donate to her legal fund. You can also read issues of Fire Ant Journal up at bloomingtonabc.noblogs.org, and you can write to Jennifer at Jennifer Rose E-23852, next line, Salinas Valley State Prison, D3-1250, next line, P.O. Box 1050, next line, Soledad, California, 93960. Then we'll hear from Comrade Z, a.k.a. Julio Alex Zuniga, an anarchist prisoner in Texas, about the situation at the Darrington Unit. Comrade Z was mentioned by Jason Renard Walker at the end of our interview, which we aired on April 19th, 2020. Although both conversations cover some hard-to-listen-to subject matter, we want to give a special warning uh, about Comrade Z's portion, which talks in detail about terrible conditions at Darrington and discusses suicide and deaths at the prison. You can read another interview with Comrade Z that appeared recently on itsgoingdown.org, and you can also check out and or purchase his artwork on Instagram by viewing at Julio Zuniga Art. Thanks to Matt Brodnax for helping set up this interview and his support for Comrade Z. You can write to Comrade Z at Julio a Zuniga, number 1961551, next line, Darrington Unit, next line, 59 Darrington Road, next line, Rosharan, Texas, 77583. And here's our brief interview with Jennifer Rose. Since this was conducted in writing, Jennifer's words were being voiced by Margaret Kiljoy, the host of the podcasts Live Like the World is Dying and We Will Remember Freedom, both members of the Channel Zero Network. Here's the jingle for her podcasts. Hello, and welcome to We Will Remember Freedom, a monthly podcast of anarchist fiction. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. Hello, and welcome to Live Like the World is Dying, your podcast for what feels like the end times. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. Hello, and welcome to the jingle for both of my podcasts. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. You can find my podcast wherever you get your podcasts or get them from the Channel Zero Network. Could you please introduce yourself for the audience, who you are and where you are? I'm glad to hear from you and happy to have this opportunity to participate in the Final Straw Radio. So, to introduce myself, my name is Jennifer Rose. I'm a trans woman incarcerated in California, currently held at Salinas Valley State Prison, a men's facility. Can you tell us a bit about where you come from and how you came to be incarcerated? I'm from Southern California, born and raised in Riverside, and spent my teenage years living in Huntington Beach, Orange County. I was in the 1980s punk rock scene around the LA area doing a lot of drinking and drugs which led to my involvement in an attempted robbery and another armed robbery for which I was jailed, convicted, and sent to prison for seven years. How did you become politicized? 
While I was serving my time at Folsom Prison, I became involved in prison protests and abolitionist struggle for which I was targeted, placed in solitary confinement, and beaten by guards. This is how I became politicized as a prison rebel, resisting brutality and torture, sabotaging and breaking a dozen prison cell windows in an inhumane ADSEG unit. I was involved in the gladiator fights where guards encouraged racial violence and then shot at us with 9mm assault rifles using live ammo. There were additional charges brought against me for attacking a pig officer, for weapon possession, and for two assaults on a state prosecutor and an associate warden. For these, I was given a 25 years to life sentence under the three strikes law. This was around 1995 and 1996. Can you talk about the struggle of being a woman in a male assigned prison? What sorts of support have you received and what sorts of hurdles? To answer your question about being a trans woman in a men's facility, we have faced the most adverse circumstances imaginable, from the discriminatory harassment and brutality of the pigs, to the hatred and violence of other prisoners, and even rapes and murder. This has begun to change more recently, at last in California, with many legal reforms and court victories. I've been able to find widespread support from outside groups like Black and Pink and TGI Justice Project, among others. Also, lots of support among abolitionist and anarchist collectives and the extended family of LGBTQ prisoners. The main hurdles we face continue to be our unsafe housing conditions, exposure to homophobic and transmisogynist violence from gangs, domestic and sexual violence. We are in a very disadvantageous situation facing the various types of gender violence on a daily. Is there anything you'd like to say about how you discovered anarchism and what inspires you about anarchy? I became politicized during the 1991 Folsom prison food strike, which was a protest against proposed visiting restrictions that cut our visiting days from four times a week to twice, weekends and holidays. Just prior to this, I was given a copy of the anarchist zine Love and Rage by another prisoner and had also been influenced by jailhouse lawyers to educate myself about so-called legal rights and remedies for which I became a strong advocate. Eventually, I would learn the hard way that the pigs don't give a fuck about the law or people's rights. It's only used at their convenience as a tool of social control and criminalization of marginalized people and communities. The thing that inspires me about anarchy is the simplicity of the idea of abolishing the state and its illegitimate power. They claim their authority from God and natural law, and originally as white male property owners under colonial government. That's crap. I love the basic concept of anarchy, which is freedom. It's basic principles of voluntary cooperation and mutual aid, non-hierarchy and autonomous collectives, internationalism and solidarity, etc. Have you been able to do much organizing within prison? If so, around what sorts of issues and how did it go? I've done a lot of organizing within prisons, including legal advocacy and jailhouse lawyer work, as former leadership in Black and Pink, and working with TGI Justice Project to change discriminatory policies and improve living conditions for trans women in the men's prisons. We've had a lot of success and made progress over the past 12 years or so, including better access to basic trans health care, hormone surgery, etc., access to and inclusion in prison programs and job assignments, accommodation of women's clothing and cosmetics, and more awareness of and prevention of sexual abuse, among other things. I'm currently awaiting an approved gender-affirming surgery and transfer to a women's facility sometime this year. You mentioned a letter with me that you organized briefly with Maoists. Are you now or have you ever been a Maoist? That's a McCarthy joke. But really, uh, how did that happen? What was that like? As for the Maoists, yes, I did work with MIM prisons for a while, which offered study group and worked directly with prisoners on many projects. I carried on a dialogue with them via correspondence, often debating with them over my anarchist sympathies and their political line on gender and state power, their dictatorship of the proletariat. I did think I could work within that Maoist framework at one point, but eventually had to reject the ideological bickering sectarianism of Maoists. I've always been an anarchist at heart, even when I went through this stage in my personal development. Eventually, I came in contact with the insurrectionary anarchist writings from Greek comrades in the FIA, IRF, and the CCF, which I was strongly influenced by and developed friendships with like-minded comrades. So you're a collective member of Fire Ant. Can you talk about the project and what part you play in it? I'm extremely proud of my involvement as a member of Fire Ant Collective. The project started as a concept I was discussing with several different comrades via regular correspondence, including Rob Cat, Michael Kimball, Sean Swain, and Bloomington ABC. We all had similar ideas of trying to organize and facilitate a national or international anarchist prisoner conference, where we could bring together the collective voice of imprisoned anarchist rebels, perhaps publish a paper, start a support fund to raise funds and material aid, 
and generally build anarchist prisoner solidarity in a way we haven't yet seen. I've always had ABC and National Jericho movement mainly focus on leftist, quote, political prisoners. Many imprisoned anarchists are not recognized as political. In point of fact, we are anti-political. However, we believe all prisons are political. Anyways, the part I played is in pulling all these comrades' ideas together and putting them in direct contact about this exciting project. Once Robcat offered to facilitate a zine, Bloomington ABC offered to provide printing and distribution free, and they also already had a support fund set up. So we all pulled together and formed Fire Ant Collective. Robcat came up with the name, and we all contributed to the zine, connecting our individual and collective struggles from prisons across the U.S. and internationally. I'm proud to be an accomplice in this seditious conspiracy towards worldwide anarchist insurgency. There have been some victories of recent in your sentence and case. Can you talk about what happened? As far as my recent sentence reduction on October 28th, 2019, this only affected one of my sentences for assault and battery on a prosecutor, a quote, non-serious felony, which I w- which was knocked down from 25 years to life to eight years. Yay. Similarly, you were telling me of improvements in the conditions of your confinement as it relates to gender, right? And what are the next steps for you and what can listeners do to support you and try to hasten your release? My next steps are getting my surgery, transferring to a woman's facility, and a parole suitability hearing on July 28, 2020 with the Board of Parole Hearings, BPH. The greatest support comes in the form of letters to the board and or the governor advocating for my release, and any amount of commissary funds which I can receive via jpay.com. I'm not sure if you're much of a reader, but do you have any book suggestions for the audience? As for recommended reading, I would strongly suggest the Emma Goldman autobiography and Asada Shakur autobiography, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, and anything by Butch Lee, Sean Swain, or Greek insurrectionary anarchists of CCF. Are there any comrades that you want to shout out on the show? Shoutouts to Robcat, Breezy, Michael Kimball, Sean Swain, Eric King, Marius Mason, Jeremy Hammond, Sacramento Prison Project, Nashville ABC, Nadja in Bloomington, and Chelsea Manning. And in case I miss someone, solidarity to all anarchists and anti-fascists. Thank you for your efforts in the struggle. To the streets, thank you. Now we'll hear Comrade Z, Alex Zuniga. This interview was also conducted in writing, so big thanks to Pearson from Coffee with Comrades for voicing Comrade Z's part. Here's a jingle for the CWC podcast, also another member of the Channel Zero Network. What's up, y'all? I'm Pearson, host of Coffee with Comrades. Coffee with Comrades is rooted in militant joy. Our hope is to cultivate a warm and inviting atmosphere, like walking into your favorite coffee shop to sit down with some of your close friends and share a heart-to-heart conversation. New episodes premiere every Tuesday, so be sure to smash that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts so that you never miss an episode. We are proud to be a part of the Channel Zero Network. Again, a warning of those conversations focuses blatantly on mistreatment of incarcerated folks that can get pretty brutal, and there is talk of suicide and death of prisoners. Would you please introduce yourself to the audience? Who are you, where are you, and how you got there? Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me on the final straw. It's an honor. My name is Julio A. Zuniga. Alex is what everyone calls me, or Comrade Z for those who are standing with me ten toes down in solidarity. I am a survivor of Beeline Solitary Confinement at Dirty Darrington Unit and currently trying to reach out to activists and anarchists in the area who can help me organize a statewide work stoppage. Enemy of the state and of the Dirty Darrington administration, my whole heart and soul is hell-bent on bringing the attention of the entire nation to the administration and its human rights violations, cruel and unusual punishment, physical assaults by staff, mailroom policy changes, inadequate law library, commissary price gouging, infestation of roaches, mice, and spiders, sewage leaks in the cells, constant power outages, the list goes on and on. The torture tactics are of primary concern because it's driving people to die by suicide. So far, it's been one suicide per year since I've been here. 
How I got here was because abolitionists in East Texas rose up against Telford Unit for housing administrative segregation inmates at that facility without telling the surrounding community about it. They were against it. People of New Boston, Texas, and Texarkana found out about the TDCJ housing G4 and G5 offenders because an officer, Davison, was murdered by a solitary confinement offender who had been tortured by Telford Unit by withholding his mail and refusing him basic C needed, like food. This caused the entire town to begin the takedown of wardens and the torture of all inmates by using lockdowns for 90 days or more, then by stopping all hot meals for an entire year in 2017. So, since that officer died in 2015, it was the people who brought forth change to that unit. It was now a pre-release unit. No administrative segregation offenders and no solitary confinement. I was not blessed with any kind of support, so I intentionally got into trouble just so they could ship me off. Best move I ever made, so I thought. However, that is how I ended up here. What can you tell listeners about the Darrington Unit and your experience being held by the TDCJ? The Dirty Darrington Unit is a hub unit. Thousands of inmates pass through here weekly, transferring to other units, coming off of UTMB Medical Branch at Galveston or Psyche Unit Jester 4. Some of them are bleeding, soiled in feces and urine. All mentally ill persons coming off Jester 4 have had no kind of hygiene for over three days. All these lay over cells are so unsanitary it takes a healthy person 24 hours to get sick by sleeping in one of those cells. There's nothing humane about that. They usually house people with wrong custody levels, endangering lives at will, resulting in physical and sexual assaults. That's Dirty Darrington's specialty. I encourage you to ask administration how many lives Dirty Darrington has claimed because they refuse to help suicidal inmates. Also, how administration uses offenders to snitch on others with a false hope of beating a disciplinary case then throwing them back into population, leaving them to kill themselves behind the dishonor. On the second week of November 2019, a guy killed himself after spilling the beans on others. When he asked them to help him because he felt suicidal, they ignored him. This is the suicide I witnessed that really proved verbatim the words that Sean Swain voices in the last act of the circus animals. When Rico killed himself, the show was like Cirque du Soleil. You have every basic need availed to you. Blankets, mattress, toilet papers, toothbrushes, toothpaste, cleaning materials, officers serving trays like they do in population with full portions. They even gave us light bulbs. It was disgusting to see it. You saw paint crews, utility crews, the works. For a week, the unit experienced humanity. But once the coast was clear and the administration got away with murder, it was back to torture tactics, a pattern I have seen one too many times on Dirty Darrington. Overall, my experience has been depressing, lonely, stressful, painful. I've seen this administration use psychological torture for 23 months straight, for this is how long I've been held in solitary confinement. Only recently was I magically released and placed in E-Line, G5, administration segregation, the filthy administrative segregation area that is notorious for roach infestations, no lighting in showers, no restrooms on the rec yard, so if you have to urinate or have a bowel movement, you are going to, on the same area, men play basketball. Fecal matter is all over the floor, and people wonder how they get sick. Easy. As soon as you come in from outside rec, they serve chow. If you have been playing basketball, then you munch on your baked chicken, then suck the grease off your fingers. You just sucked on chicken-flavored fecal matter and urine. Dirty Darrington knows exactly what it's doing. Environmental disaster, B-line, E-line, G-line, A-line, C-line, D-line are all torture areas. In the winter, it's cold showers. In the summer, they heat your water for you. No coincidence. There's so much more. There are over 200 men in administrative segregation and solitary confinement on Dirty Darrington. Some men are going through it worse because they believe this is a normal prison policy. It's not. I'm here to expose this unit and its human rights violations. 
I appreciate you hearing me out. It's hard to imagine if the staff and administration aren't aware of the conditions there. Are they showing any signs of working to fix the situation? I knew something was terribly wrong with this unit when it runs through four wardens in less than two years. They are aware of every single atrocity. They personally handle all grievances, and it's rare an inmate ever wins on step one. They have to go all the way to Huntsville with their grievances to get a fair treatment. By that time, it's been 60 days solid since the claim was made. It's designed this way to ensure we never win any kind of grievance claim. Another way, as it is now, is that they refuse us grievances altogether on Dirty Darrington because they also are aware that if they hand them out, they will be reading grievances for years. They know this place is crumbling to pieces. If it rains outside, it rains inside too. The guards look like underwater welders when it rains. They wear raincoats indoors to stay dry. Nothing is being done except punishment and enslavement. I am on a mission to learn from outside sources how to organize, to create a psychological warfare on this administration in the name of all the dead that could not deal with their torture chambers, and for the mentally ill who cannot speak out against them, who are, as we speak, living in horrible conditions on Major Farr's solitary confinement. It's only a matter of time before another death by suicide. We can thank Dirty Darrington's administrative segregation ringmasters for imposing torture on the already weak men by starving them, by withholding their mail, by refusing mailroom to give them pictures of loved ones or birthday cards, or by sending their shakedown team to physically abuse them and confiscate their property. It's all designed to break you. And it's happening every day. How do the conditions you've described above affect the health of prisoners? What's the condition of physical and mental health care available at the Darrington unit? Personally, I don't get sick easy, but since being on Dirty Darrington, I've had a serious sinus infection, primarily from the mold in the showers and the dust that carries all kinds of germs. As far as a psyche at Dirty Darrington goes, it's got potential. As far as physical, you've got the infamous Nazi doctor, Spear, extorting everyone, but not giving adequate care to anyone. If he gets sick, they still allow this idiot to practice. Nothing gets done about his childish outbursts. He once tried to do a rectal exam on me. He said it was my yearly checkup. This was the first time I met him. As he stood up and slapped on a latex glove, my spidey sense told me to ask a simple question. What's the name on that computer, sir? He said, your Contreras number blah blah blah, and I was like, I'm out. I've had problems with this doctor ever since. Namely, because retaliation is a trend on Dirty Darrington when you file a grievance. I tried to explain to everyone that this man tried to do. No one tried to help me. He's still here. All my medical treatment was taken away by this man for no reason other than I am or was chronic care hypoglycemic. If you have heat restrictions, work restrictions, anything that will make your ailment easier to handle, Dr. Spear will terminate it and then send you into a twilight zone of sick calls just so he can charge the copay. Others, he refuses to treat simply because it's not life or death. Can you talk about suicides that you've been aware of during your time? Are there any in particular that you'd like to reflect on? Are there any strings that tie the circumstances together? Well, I've been on Dirty Darrington for two years, going on three. I got screwed out of my legal work, got all of my medical restrictions taken away, basically because I am indigent and I have no one on the outside to call here and raise a fuss, which is the only time you see inmates get what they need. So, B-line, third row, fifth cell, 2018. A young man hung himself. The image of a nurse chest compressing this man never left me. It's really caused me a lot of anger. I was senseless. It taught me just how they break men's minds. It would disgust you. I remember this older man who would wake up screaming and just slowly losing all reality. These torturers left him in that cell with a stack of trays full of food with dead mice and roaches that he would just stack up towards the end of his sanity. Inmates could smell death. They tried to talk to him but couldn't stand the stench of death. So they brought Captain Lance to the kitchen boss to remove the trays, stacked 20 high. But you cannot talk to a broken man. He was a vessel. Nothing more. 
After two canisters of pepper spray, still nothing, until finally Captain Lance had the courage to tell administration that he was no longer right. It was his voice that forced him to send off that night, never to be sent again. For months, they left that man in this condition. It's happening now. This is normal? I'm not trying to hear that. For these men, I ask to be armed with support, to feed the torturers a taste of their own medicine. I opened my eyes all the way at this past suicide in November 2019. I am done talking. We need a bombardment of activism, protest, support. We need an uprising so this administration will be forced to take responsibility for all their fuckery. One thing I know is we have nothing to gain for staying in good standing. Good time credit is not counting towards parole. Work time credit is another tool that they have to control prisoners. Only the prisoners that still believe in the tooth fairy are too scared to accept this fact. People have tried for years to have these laws passed. Republicans are not interested in helping us. With a statewide work stoppage, we will bring all these men's dreams to fruition. We need to spread these facts to the entire state and shut it down. Stop slaving for your ringmasters. You want real change? Stop doing your slave jobs. Stop putting money in politicians' pockets and ask them to put it in your account to pay you for the work that you do. Slave days ended over 150 years ago. Why do you volunteer your work for the oppressor? Those of you who have no one, wouldn't you like to support yourself in prison instead of risking solitary confinement for stealing food to sell in your living areas for hygiene? I could go on and on. What are working conditions like for the prisoners incarcerated by the Texas Department of Criminal Justice as you've experienced? What sorts of privileges come along with that work? What sorts of pay, if any, and what sort of work is it? They work those guys to exhaustion. They do not pay. The work is Breaking. No one will receive as much as an extra portion of food. These units are still slave plantations, only the name has changed. Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Research the Sugarland 95. You'll see for yourself what I'm talking about. It's time to bring this slavery to a screeching halt. How have you experienced support while you've been on the inside? What would you like from folks on the outside? I had to go to extremes again to have the support I have today. I never really conformed to prison culture. I love tattoos, motorcycles, art, hunting, fishing, boats, and the only way I was ever going to see or hear about that is by reaching out. As a result of picking up a contraband cell phone, I met Mongoose Matt, my calling a random tattoo shop. <laughs> it was awesome. Fine Line Tattoo NYC is Matt's workplace, and it took all but 60 seconds to make one of the best friends I have ever had. It makes me so proud to say that. Shortly after getting pinched for contraband, Matt has been there through all my solitary confinement, sending in anarchist literature, commissary bread for hygiene, and art supplies. And in seven years now on a 15 sentence for a so-called murder, it's his solidarity and support that saved my life and my sanity. Dirty Darrington had officers from the McConnell unit come hit us up for shakedown, and those creeps took all my property and left me with nothing. This was my breaking point. I just felt like giving up. But Mongoose comes flying in with letters and powerful words of encouragement. And because of him, I am still fighting today. They tried to break me intentionally. I know this for a fact. Only problem is, I survived. TDCJ's cease to speak or cease to breathe motto doesn't scare me. I have nothing to lose. Now, I'm asking for you to stand with me until we punch a hole in this darkness and make it bleed light. Sean Swain is the other reason I fight. How you doing, Sean? Here's the deal. Folks out there, my only weapon at the moment is this here pen. I want surrounding activists to contact me so we can get started. This is still far from over, and I believe that it's the only way. And I believe that it's only through the voice of the people that we can bring this down to a statewide level. I could use all the support available in my fight against the state. Things are slowly changing for me, so I will be allowed more visitors on Dirty Darrington unit. Soon, I'll be allowed to call out. In the meantime, anyone can write me. There is so much to learn and prepare. 
No doubt that without your direct support, places like Dirty Darrington and surrounding plantations will continue to thrive, rubbing it in the community's face. The Texecution Slate is also a slavery state. Shut them down. Nobody is gaining a thing. It's a slap in the face when the officials of the state come here to lie to everyone that they are doing everything they can to change these laws so that we actually become productive. The only laws passed are laws that make it harder for us to get home to our families. For the oppressed indigent offenders who cannot afford hygiene products, organizing a hygiene run to bring forth relief, peace of mind, and a sense of compassionate care. I've seen exactly how good this place could be, but as long as we have ringmasters like these hypocrite wardens, coward-ass majors and captains, vindictive supervisors who love to use cowardly acts and body-slam people while in restraints such as Sergeant Akinsunyu, Sergeant Williams, Sergeant Estrada, Sergeant Baker, who writes her own rules when it comes to keeping people down. All these cowards, and a few more on my shit list, need to be burned at the stake for their inhumane treatment of human beings. We need to give them a little perspective. We need to all come at them via phone calls, media, advocacy centers, anyone that can hit them where it hurts to show them that we are not alone. We are not going to accept this kind of abuse and pretend it's normal, that it's policy. Policy is made up as they walk to the pisser. It's a shame the population is in love with their ringmaster. As a survivor of these gulags, food is still the number one tool used to break solitary confinement offenders. Many months I went hungry, and many months I eat the unwanted veggies inmates discarded just so I could survive. Sometimes, portions were almost a smear of meat on trays. We need to end this today. What inspires you these days? What brings you joy? Oh, that's easy. Defiance from Detritus Books is my inspiration. I've gotten very close to Comrade Mongoose, and against the peace and dignity of the Texecution state, I'm in constant contact with Comrade King and Comrade Swain. I wish them the best in the struggle, and hope to see them soon, for I am coming up for parole soon. It's a crapshoot, but optimism is helpful in situations such as this. I get my jollies by sending Matt handcrafted portraits of all kinds of cool, weird characters. Y'all are actually owners of one of my pieces. Thank you. Is there anything I failed to ask you about that you want to talk about? You all can check out my Instagram, Julio A. Zuniga Art, or contact Matt to place an order for the handmade portrait. I only have number two pencils to work with because this unit will not allow my supporters to send me art supplies. Anything that makes people happy, like greeting cards and pictures, are slowly being taken away from us as well. Go figure. This is Bible Seminary College, too. This is the unit that pumps out field ministers. Unbelievable, huh? Ass backwards, I tell ya. I gotta let you go for now. It's been an amazing and liberating experience. You all are amazing. Please allow me to send hugs to Sean Swain, Eric King, and to all the comrades who are in the trenches fighting their ringmaster. Thank you for setting the example. I hope to be in that position soon. Thanks, y'all. Hope to hear from you soon. I would like to close with a quote from Benjamin Tucker. Power feeds on its spoils and dies when its victims refuse to be despoiled. They can't persuade it to death. They can't vote it to death. They can't shoot it to death, but they can always starve it to death. If you would like to contact Alex, please send a letter to Julio A. Zuniga, number 1961551, Darrington Unit, 59 Darrington Road, Rocheron, Texas, 77583. As a closing note, I had hoped to share recent words from Jason Goodluck, currently incarcerated at Toledo CI, where he would give a brief update on his situation and how the ODRC is not handling COVID-19. However, technical difficulties got in the way. Suffice to say, prisoners were still being transferred into Toledo CI shortly before April 15th when we had our conversation. Prisoners were not being given any significant protective gear, nor cleaning supplies, and folks were starting to get sick. You can learn about Jason's case, watch the documentary about him, and find out how to support him at freejasongoodlock.org, and you can reach Jason via JPay with his prison number or um, for email, or you can write him at jasonwilliamgoodlock, number 284-561, 
Next line, P.O. Box 80033. Next line, Toledo CI 43608. This is The Final Straw, and I'm Bursa Goodness. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.